Good morning. <laughs> yeah. Countdown's over. <laughs> Oh, that was the door opening up. I thought it was feedback coming from my mic. All right, we're in Ephesians chapter 2. If you, if you would, turn with me in your Bible, so Ephesians chapter 2. You got, you got the, oh, let's start this side. You got the spirit, you got the soul, you've got the body. Let me ask you this question this morning. Really consider this. Which do you most relate to? The spirit or the body? The body, you know, the physical material. That's what the body relates to. Only the things you can see, the things you can feel, the things you can touch. It encompasses a lot of our feelings and emotions because that's what our feelings and emotions are often attached to is the body. So what do you most relate to? The things of this world? Power? Position? Drugs, television, money. What do, what do you most relate to? Then you got the spirit. The, and the things of the spirit can only relate to the things of God. The spirit relates to the things of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. So what do you most relate to right now? What do you most relate to? And the point I'm getting to is this. To the same degree that you relate to either or is, what is going to be to the same degree after you leave this body. So if you're most relating to this world, the physical material, where does that leave your soul? Completely empty, you see. But if you're relating to the, the, the things of God, love, joy, peace, patience, the things that the Spirit offers to us, and guess what happens? This world really becomes irrelevant because you're in the Spirit, you see. You're relating to God and His promise. He says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and everything else will be added to you. And when you leave this body, if you're relating to God, if you're a part of the family of God in the Spirit, then His promise is a new body, an immortal body, an eternal body. You got the Spirit, you got the soul, you got the body. What is your soul most connected to right now? And again, if your soul is solely <laughs> connected to the physical, the material, this world is going to burn. Where's your soul going to be? What's your soul connected to? God or this world? You see, your soul will perish. Because your, your spirit, some of us, spirit, soul, and body if there's no spirit, if there's no relationship to the spirit, then you're basically body and soul. And so your soul leaves the body. It's eternal death. It's eternal darkness. eternal separation from God. If it's, if it's connected to this world, it's eternal hell. Spirit, soul, body. Paul says, chapter 1, verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. So that you will know, know, have this intimate relationship. That's what this word know means in the Greek. It speaks of an intimate relationship. I know my wife. Do you know the hope? Have you entered into a, such a relationship with God that you know this hope? You see, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? That we are his riches. We are his glory. There's an inheritance in him. The richness. There's richness that we can tap into right now, that we can know right now, Paul says. But what are you relating to? 
The spirit or the body? The spirit or the body? See, if you're lacking joy, if you're lacking peace, then chances are you're lacking intimacy with God. If your life is just full of conflict and quarrels and fights and bickering and backbiting and there's no peace, that just speaks of where your soul is. He says, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe? There, these are in accordance with the working of His strength and might, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Paul tells the Ephesians, he says, I've heard, heard of your love. You guys are in Christ. You're, you're, you're in Him. You're sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. But I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so you can see these riches, these heavenly riches. He continues on as we pick up in chapter 2. Well, we're still in review, but chapter 2. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. This is where we formerly were. We were body and soul. We were dead in the spirit. We had no relationship with God in the spirit. We could not relate to the things of God. We could not know his hope, his peace, his riches because we were spiritually dead. We were craving that. We were craving love. We were craving peace. We are craving satisfaction. And so we could only turn to the things of the world, to the body, to find that. But we could, we could, we could never obtain it. People go lifelong in the pursuit of happiness, in the pursuit of satisfaction and joy. And many of these people you will meet later in their life, and they're just bitter, they're angry, they're, they're just filled with hate because they never handed their hearts over to God. In which you formerly walked in accord, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He's talking about there's these people that are being disobedient to the gospel. You know, we were, but we were in their place. We were separated from God. We, we were walking in a course uh, of this world. You know, the, you know Jesus, was, uh, Jesus and Satan was on the top of the pinnacle, and he says, bow down and worship me, and I will give you this world. Jesus didn't argue and debate with him because this world, this world system belongs to Satan. And we were a part of that when we were before we became Christians, before we received the Holy Spirit of promise. We were operating in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. We were all about the flesh. And because we were all about the flesh, we were the walking dead, just like zombies. Following the course of the world. It speaks to the direction of the wind. However the wind blew, that's the direction we went. We were under Satan's power and authority. We were enslaved to the flesh, the wants and the desires of the flesh. He goes on and says, And among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. We were doomed. We were born separated from God. The judgment had been passed. For the penalty of sin is death. We were born dead. We were born destined for hell. Predestined for hell. It is, that was who we were. We were separated from God. Indulging in the, the, the desires of the flesh. We were slaves to our own fleshly desires. Because we had no other choice. We didn't have the spirit. So we had to follow the appetites of the flesh. We were going to find satisfaction and fulfillment. The only recourse that we had, the only direction we had was to turn to the world. The things that we could relate to in the physical realm because we were in a physical body. The things you could touch, the things you could feel, the, the things that you could see. That's why Jesus came though, don't you see? And Paul will get in a little bit deeper into this in just a moment. Jesus came. Because we were just simply physical beings. We could not relate to God. But God, you see, came down so we could relate to Him. He came in such a way that we could see and understand so that we could perceive. 
You remember what John wrote? That which we have seen, that which we have touched, that which we have handled. You see, Jesus became a man because we were men who could not relate to God. So God came down as a man to say to us, I love you. I can relate to you. I get it. I understand. He says, that's why John wrote, we have seen him. We have touched him. We've handled him. We've, we've reclined at a table with him. Jesus came so we could relate, so that we could receive the Spirit, the Spirit of God, so we could know the mind of God. Who can know the mind of man except for man? Paul would write. He says, but who, who can know the mind of God ex except the Spirit of God? We could not connect with the mind of God. We were in darkness, separated from God. We could not know his mind. So what did he do? He came down, re entered into a relationship with him in a way that we could see, feel, and understand him, touch him. And then he dies for us. Now he gives us his spirit, the spirit of love. Now we can relate to the mind of God. The mind of God, the Old Testament. No one could see it. No one could understand it. No one could get it. Paul will later get into, deeper in this as well in chapter 2. <clears throat> he says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive with Christ. I can't help but think of Lazarus, right? John chapter 11. Lazarus, come forth. He was resurrected from the dead, right? God raised him from the dead. Chapter 12, what was he doing? He was sitting at a dinner table, reclining with the Lord, you see. Having dinner with the Lord. That's what God does for us. He res resurrects us from the dead. And he reclines with us. He invites us to a meal. We're going to have that great marriage feast in heaven one day. That's the promise. That's the hope. He's resurrected us just as he resurrected Lazarus. Lazarus is in this relationship with Jesus, his Lord. That's us. It's a picture of us. We've been raised up. We've been raised from the dead. Resurrected. By grace you have been saved. He outlines this several times. By grace you have been saved. It's God's grace. It's God's gift, he will go on to say. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is an eternal thing for ages to come. We're, we're going to be his reward. We're gonna, he's going to show us off. This is what it's been about. For grace you have been saved or by grace you have been saved. Through faith. It's our faith. But wait, wait, wait. Is it really our faith? Is it really our faith that saves us? Listen to what he says. And that not of yourselves. You didn't work up faith. You didn't earn faith. You see, he's saying faith is something that God gives to you. What did Jesus do? He came down. He ministered to mankind for three years. He spoke with this great gospel message for three years. And then God himself goes to the cross. What did Jesus say? He says, when I am high and lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. You see, our faith is in what we can see, what we can feel, what we can touch, what those things of the world, the physical material realm. God comes in the physical material realm and shows us his great love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, he, Christ died for us. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we'd be children of God. You see, our faith came by God coming first and demonstrating his great love toward us. Then we take our faith out of the things of the world and place it in him. But it was him who drew us. It wasn't so, well, we, we, we didn't have life in the Spirit. We didn't know God. How could we put our faith in something we did not know? Something we could not understand. You see, he, even this faith that I have in Him is faith that He has come and given to me. 
We do nothing. Nothing. He demonstrates his love. He draws us towards him. Now, it's at this point we choose to put our faith in him because he's come in a physical, material way in which we can relate. But it was all his working because he so loved this world that he was willing to die so that we could be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even the faith that we have is a God-given faith. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. I did nothing for my salvation. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3. He says, you foolish Galatians who have bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly betrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? By being a good little boy and girl, following all the rules, rights, rituals, and regulations? Is that how you obtained your salvation? Or by hearing with faith? God has given us faith. We're listening now. That's how we got saved. Not by working out, you know, being a good, good boy or girl. We, he, he came and demonstrated his faith or his love toward us. We put our faith in him at that point. Now, the point that Paul's making here, and this is something that Paul is trying to express to the Ephesians as well, is that we did nothing and we can do nothing. The Galatians were tempted to start following the rules, rights, and regulations of the law. Paul says if you do that, you have fallen from grace. You have severed yourself from Christ. He says, who was Jesus publicly betrayed as crucified before whose eyes? It was the Jews who were, who were living by a law, who, who thought they had it all together. They had the law. They had the hope. They had the promises. And they, they believed they were saved because they kept that law. But it was Jesus, Jesus had to come and be crucified before them, before their eyes. And Paul's point is he had to be crucified before the Jew because the Jew could not be saved by the works of the law, by their own works and by the, their own strength and power. Jesus had to be publicly portrayed as crucified before them. He had to... You see, here's another thing is the law was designed to show us where we were and what we needed. And that's what the law did for the Jew. You're separated from God. You need a Savior. You need a Redeemer. Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified by them. Now, here's where I'm trying to get to. The Galatians were tempted to go to this law. Paul says, are you out of your mind why would you do that? Were you saved by your good deeds, by the works that you were doing, or by simple faith in Jesus? How were you saved? Paul is telling the, the, the Ephesians, you were saved simply by faith in Christ. Paul's telling the Galatians, why would you want to turn to the law? What are you trying to do? You've already been saved, right? You've been saved by what Jesus has done. Not by your good works or your good deeds, but by what Jesus has done. Jesus said, when I'm high and lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And the cry from the cross is, it is finished. The work's done. No more work is required. You're already saved. You already have life in the Spirit. Now you have this relationship with God in the Spirit. What are you trying to do? Perfect the Spirit by doing something according to the law? You're trying to perfect the Spirit? You're already trying to perfect perfection? <laughs> what are, are you mind? Out of your mind? You see, what, what you have a tendency to do is Jesus cries out from the cross of Calvary, it is finished, the work is done. He's now seated in the heavenly places. He's seated at the right hand of God. We're in Christ. But then we have this tendency to say, yeah, but. I've got to stop doing this. I've got to start doing that. I've got to stop doing the other. 
What are we doing when we say that? We're calling Jesus a liar. He said, it is finished. The work is done. Now, Paul will go on from here, understand. Talking about the value of life in the Spirit, rather than putting your faith in the flesh. But see, this is where we oftentimes become legalistic, where we get things all scrambled up. The purpose here is not to perfect ourselves, to become a better boy or girl. The purpose here is so we can experience more of the riches of Christ Jesus. And that's when we stop putting our faith in the things of the world and put our faith in what Jesus Christ has already done for us. We're not working to become more pure, to perfect what Jesus has done. We're, we're turning from the world to experience more of what Jesus has done, more of the life in the Spirit. Because the more I can relate to God in the here and now, it's going to be, um, it'd be a greater... <sighs> The more I can relate to him now, the more peace and joy I'm going to have. But it's also, um, I'm missing a word here, and it's sleep deprivation, but I'll move on. <laughs> Maybe I'll come to you in a second here. Um, let's see. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, we're going to get there. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works. Not a result of works. We did nothing to be saved. That no one may boast. We have no reason to boast. So I can, you know what? You know, I've only been a Christian for X number of years, and now I'm a pastor. You know, I have arrived. It was because I've worked so hard, right? I've studied long hours. I've done this. I've done that. I can boast. No, I cannot boast. No one can boast about anything. Not even their... Their, their Christian position. And if you're boasting about your pres- Christian positions, it's only evidence you don't know the love of God or your own sinfulness. Understand that. You have no reason to boast. You've done nothing. And if you can't understand that, Paul understood it because he would go on to say, he says, Paul, I'm Paul, the very least of all the saints. That's the thing I've discovered over the 20 plus years as a Christian. The longer I walk with Christ, the longer that I'm a Christian in this relationship with Christ, the more I understand how sinful, how wretched I am. Paul would also declare that, make this boast. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ, our God. He delivers us. Uh, thank you. I love this part. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. Jesus, our love song, right? But he goes on to say, Paul says here, for we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. The Greek word that's used here is poema. It's where we get our word poem. We are his love song. He, we, you know, he's this, <laughs> I'm not good without sleep. <laughs> he's writing this song. He, he's, uh, I'm, well, who's one of the great pianists? That's what I was trying to come up with. Mozart, you know, he's the Mozart. He's writing this beautiful song, right? We are his poema. We are his love song. And I, I see this beautiful love song. Back in the Song of Solomon. You know, the Song of Solomon, a lot of people don't want to touch that because of the, the relationship that's going on there. But it, it's, a, it's simply this. It's a picture of our relationship with Jesus. He's written us a love song. He's delivered us a love song. But our lives, you see, is a love song. It's going to end very beautifully. It's going to end in a way that we could not fathom. He says we are his workmanship. We are his Love song created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, understand this. Wait just a second. Let me finish that verse. 
He says, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. There was a, this really good work that was done. Really good work. It is good. Upon the cross, Jesus did the good work. But he's also prepared good works. In, you see, we're in him. And there's good works that's prepared. Our lives is filled with good works. It's filled with good works. Day by day is filled with good works. But sometimes we don't see it as good. Why? Because our faith is in this world. We're relating to the world. We can only relate to the physical material realm. And when our physical material realm gets wrecked, we don't see good. You see, this is why it's so important to draw closer to Christ Jesus. The closer we draw to Him in the Spirit, in a relationship of love in the Spirit, we'll begin to see even the wreckage and the carnage that's surrounding us, surrounding us, is good. For our God calls us all things to work together for good. For those who love Him. For those who's called for His, into, for his purposes. Those who's called into the good work. We got seven years of hell about to take place on planet Earth. But guess what? It's good. The end result is good. It ends very good. Because Jesus is sitting on the throne, you see. See, but how do you relate? What do you relate to? This physical, material realm? The things you can see, the things you can touch, the things you can smell, the, 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 the things of the body? Your feelings and emotions, is that what's driving your life? Or is it the Word of God, the promise of God? He says all things are working together for good. See, it doesn't matter what happened. I can have peace and joy in spite of what I see because I, my home is in heaven. I'm going home someday. And, and you know, I'm going to leave this physical body, this body that's filled with pain and aches and, you know, just... Uh, Sleep deprivation. <laughs> I'm going to leave it. That's going to be a glorious day. I'm going to leave this body of pain, and I'm going to receive a resurrected body, an eternal body, and I'm for, going to be forever with my bridegroom. And he's preparing good works for us so that we could walk in them because we are his love song. You see, he's molding and shaping our lives as we walk through this world, as we travel through. He's perfecting us. And he's, he's using us as well to reach others. There's good works that's prepared. I don't understand it sometimes, but my faith is not what I can see. My faith is in him. So no matter what happens, I say, you know what? God intends this for good somehow. Because my my hope's not in this world, and my faith is not what I can see, but rather in Him. My hope is in heaven. Verse 11, it says, Therefore, remember that formerly, the, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by the so-called, so-called, I love how Paul uses that, that word so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh. It's all about the flesh. It's all about relating to God in the flesh, not in the spirit, but in the flesh, you see, by human hands, the work of man. You see, the, the, the one thing that set a Jew apart, well, there's two things, really, their diet and circumcision. Circumcision is what set the Jewish man apart from the Gentile. It was a circumcision. This was the mark of God upon their lives. But it's a physical mark. And it was an illustration of that which was to come. The, the physical circumcision uh, makes one more sensitive, right? But, the, but there's a spiritual circumcision that comes place, takes place. And Paul talks about this as being the circumcision of the heart. What does, this, what does this circumcision of the heart do? It makes us more sensitive to the things of the Spirit, to the spiritual realm, so we can relate to God. 
So we have a deeper intimacy and love for God. The Hebrew writer would later go on to write. Now, this becomes very, very important right here. This is very important. The Hebrew writer would go on to write or to say that the law was once written in the stone, but now this law is written upon our hearts. What's the law about? Love. The bottom line is love. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The bottom line is love. That's the law. And this law of love is now written on our hearts. I've used this illustration in the past. Some of you may have heard it, but I think it's a great illustration. There's once this lady who was married to this evil man, this brutal man, this man who made all kinds of demands of her. And he, he would often write this long checklist of things that this woman, his wife, needed to do before he went to work, right? He needed to do this, do that, do the other, do the other, do, uh, and, you know, whatever. And, and, but he, he would say, you know, if, you, if she didn't get this list done, he, she would catch hell. He was brutal. He was horrible toward her. Well, this man dies. She marries a new husband. This new husband treated her as a princess. He did everything he could do to bless her. You know, run bath water, bring her flowers, bring her candy, take her out to dinner. He just wanted to love on her, and that's what he did. He just loved on her. Well, then, sometime later, after she marries this new man, she's up in the attic, she's searching around, and then she comes across one of these checklists of her former husband, this brutal man. She's looking over this checklist, right? And, and she began to realize something. In this checklist, everything that was demanded of her, she was now doing for her new husband, and he never made a single demand. You see, the law makes the man. This is how you love God. But you see, the spirit of love that has come into our home and then form of a new husband. And what happens in our hearts? We love him. We follow this law of love, and it's never even demanded of us. He just loves us. And he treats us so good. He he's, has all these promises of eternity. And we can't help. And the more we get to know him, the more we love him. And, and, and then the natural response is submission. And loving in return, following, we not following our rules, rites, and rituals and checklists. We just follow that love or that law out of love. We meet the demands of love, I'm sorry, of the law through love. It's a response, it's an attitude. He, he, he's not demanding us of uh, anything of us, He loves us. And the natural submit, or response to that love is submission. And love is the result. Love is the fruit. He said, therefore, remember that you formerly walked, you, the Gentiles, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at one time separate from Christ excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So all the promises that were written in the Old Testament was for the Jew. Jesus was going to come to the Jew. He was going to come as their king and rule and reign over the world for a thousand years. That was what they were looking for. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, they were looking for a conquering king. These, all these promises were made to the Jews, to Abraham. Your descendants will be like the sand of the seashore, like the stars of heaven. They'll be innumerable. Your descendants will be. And you will rule as a king. That was their promise. And the, and the promise was a Messiah who would come and deliver them from the strong arms of the world, you see. These promises were to them. They, the Gentiles had no promises given to them as far as the eye could see, as far as their heart could understand. But all these were to the Gentiles. I'm sorry, to the Jew. 
All the hopes, all the promises, all the covenants was to the Jew. By the way, let me just cover this real briefly. That's why, because these promises were what they were looking for in their Messiah. But they didn't understand their Messiah. They didn't understand the purpose of the Messiah. They were looking for someone to ride into Jerusalem on this white horse and overthrow the Romans. They had the promises right here in Scripture, and that's going to happen someday. But they didn't understand how their God would deliver them first. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. We were separated from God. We didn't understand the hopes of, or the Jews had the, the law, they had the prophets, they had all the promises. We had nothing. But by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. What Jesus has come to do was written in the law. Paul will go into greater detail how this mystery had been unveiled to him, how the Messiah was to come and bless the entire world. Paul, who was a Jew, could only see what Jews could see. But God had given him a, a spiritual insight. And he would, do, he would go on to say, I can, and you know, this mystery has been unveiled for me and the prophets to declare what Jesus has come to do. Jesus came to pay the sin debt as, as it was prophesied, good God had said right from the very beginning that he will deal with the sin issue. He came and did that because there was a dividing wall. There was a veil, if you will. You remember in the, uh, in the Garden of Eden, God cast Adam and Eve out. They could not come back into the garden. Why? Because he had stationed two angels there with flaming swords, right? These flaming swords were guarding the way into the Garden of Eden. But what was in the temple? What was in the, the tabernacle? There was a veil there. There was a veil that prevented you know, uh, anyone from going into the Holy of Holies, which represents going into the presence of God. Only one person could do that once per year, and that was the great high priest. He would go beyond the veil. And, and it was a picture of our great high priest and what he would once, or do one, one day. But the, in the temple, there was this veil, this barrier that prevented man from going into the presence of God. It was symbolic of what at the Garden of Eden. What was up on this veil that, that, that blocked the, the way into the Holy of Holies? Two cherubims. Two cherubims. Remember the cherubims of the flaming, with the flaming swords at the Garden of Eden? They prevented from people going in, right? Now there's a veil in the temple representing the way into God's presence, right? What's happened with that veil? When Jesus Christ was crucified, he declared, it is finished. The work is done, right? What happened immediately after that? There was darkness that came over the face of the earth. There was this great earthquake. And we're told that the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. From top to bottom. It's as if God reached down and tore that veil, that dividing wall, that barrier. And, it was, and now, anyone who walked into the temple, once that earthquake took place, after Jesus made that great declaration, it is finished, the veil in the temple is torn. If anyone walked into the temple, they could see right in to the Holy of Holies. The declaration was clear. All men can now come into my presence. It was, the way was made for all men. That's why Paul would go on to write, and I think it was John, he said, he, Paul, Paul said, that veil was his flesh. The Hebrew writer. Paul and the Hebrew writer. That veil was his flesh. When he was crucified, it was a picture of sin being dealt with, and the veil was torn. Jesus, you see, by what he's done, has made the way for all men to come into the presence of God. You see, there was only one person 
who could come into the presence of God. The great high priest, Jesus, our great high priest, has made a way for all mankind to come into the Holy of Holies and experience the riches of our God, the riches of the kingdom. But do we do that? Do we do that? Do we relate to what Christ has done for us? Are we relating to this world, to the flesh, our feelings, our emotions, our wants and desires of the flesh? We have access to all the riches of heaven. But are we relating to what Christ has done for us? For thousands of years, man tried to fight his way into the presence of God by being a good little boy, by being a good little girl, by doing good deeds. You know, if, well, if, my, if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, I can, I can get access to heaven. Jesus said, it is finished. The work is done. You can now come into my presence. You can come into the presence of the holy of holies. Are we doing that? Paul's encouragement here. Christ has done the work. There was a dividing wall that kept you out. Jesus has removed that dividing wall. He's removed that barrier. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so you'll know the hope of His calling, so that you'll know all the riches of Christ Jesus. And might reconcile them in one body. All men. Jesus died for the sin of the entire world, both the Jew and the Greek, for the male for the female, for the red man, for the yellow man, for the brown man. We are all one in Christ. We're one in Him. We're one body. And uh, this next section, I was hoping to get to it this, this morning, but I'm not going to get there. I want to take this in a lump sum of being this one body. Um, all right, let me see this real quick. Now, we'll go ahead and stop there. So, Jesus has made the way for us to come in the presence of God, experience all the riches of Christ Jesus, so that we can experience peace and joy in spite of what happens in this physical realm, because we have the hope of heaven. We're just passing through. This is all just temporal, right? We're just passing through, just like Abraham. He never laid down roots because he was looking for a city that God had promised, a city whose builder and architect, not made with human hands, but made by God. That's where our hearts should be, looking for that great and awesome city. This holy city, New Jerusalem, that is going to come down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her bridegroom. Anyway, we'll close there. Um, I know this seems like a, a sudden stop, but I realized I wasn't going to be able to accomplish the second half that I wanted to accomplish this morning. So we'll close there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ Jesus. We thank you for removing that barrier, that dividing wall. We thank you for inviting us into the present. As we close this morning, we'll remember. We will remember your promises, and we'll, we'll just... Seek to bless you because you have blessed us. And we know that we'll be doing this for, for millenniums to come, for 10,000 years. And we'll have 10,000 reasons to bless you because you have blessed us so abundantly. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.